do is, everybody talks about what they do. Let's talk about who we are and why we're right, here. Man. So let's you know, give you, I'll start it off there and say, I'm Hank. And I started in the ad business in 1965 in Mad Men era. And I've lived it for the last 46 years without a break. I've been 10 years on the client side and, and 35 years on the agency side. So I guess I'm one of these seen it, done it all guys. And uh, I'm 68. And I can tell you that right now is the single best time I've ever seen to be in this business. It is amazing what can be done. And uh, it's just, and at a time when I was supposed to retire, along came digital and everything that you guys do, and it's re-energized me, and I'm having a ball. And finally, the last thing is I'm privileged to be an adjunct professor of marketing at USC's Marshall School of Business, where I learn every day. And right now, I'm supposed to be giving a lecture to my class. And instead of listening to me, this is streaming live into the classroom. Just think about the last time you were in school. So it's amazing. So that's me. That's why I'm here. <clears throat> Michael? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there. It's getting a little late on the afternoon. And thanks to Brian and team for bringing together uh, phenomenal speakers over the past couple of days. It's great to hear people really share uh, candidly so we all can kind of learn and, and move forward together. <laughs> And of course, thanks for the students that are joining us as well. I've got the privilege at uh, Coca-Cola of working in our Global Connections Group. And my role in a nutshell is really to provide thought leadership and global strategy and most importantly, common solutions to our marketers around the world uh, to leverage all things social. So it's uh, you know, a little perspective. We've got about 3,000 marketers around the world working across uh, nearly 500 brands in 200 plus countries. So there's a whole lot of really, really brilliant people out there that are far smarter than I in marketing. And it's my job to um, give them solutions that are safe, effective, uh, and efficient for the company to really exercise and leverage the use of social. Hi, everyone. I'm Marissa Thalberg. Uh, as Hank said, I head corporate digital marketing worldwide for the Estee Lauder companies. Um, and I say companies because we started as the Estee Lauder brand, but we're actually now a portfolio company of over 28 um, very well-known prestige beauty brands. And so I have the privilege of overseeing corporate digital marketing across all of them. Um, in addition, a little fun fact, and if you're tweeting, you'll see that my handle is actually at Executive Moms because in 2002, um, pretty soon after I became a mom for the first time, I found that there was just a dearth of resources for working moms like myself and was prodded by enough people to go start something. So in, in a sort of bizarre effort to solve my working mom issues, saddled myself with a second career, if you will, by starting executivemoms.com. So I've continued to do that since then, and it's been a really interesting lens because it was actually a pre-social pre media, really. And so um, it's kind of a fun way of living in, in both, both sides of the equation, if you will. Great. So that's yeah. who we are and what we'll, we'll talk about. I'm going to tee up some topics with a couple of slides, nothing uh, you know, uh, too heavy here. But why all this is possible is really a function of three things colliding. Consumers in control, you've heard that a thousand times. Next, brands live in glass houses. We are live in glass houses. We must be open. And third, and I think most importantly, is that the humanity and people behind the brands that touch it everywhere finally have a voice and they're finally being heard. So what that's causing us to do is to really get in touch with the art and science of listening and have the courage to listen and do things about it. You have two companies that are really knee deep in this right now. How are you doing it? Who wants to start? Michael, you start. Ladies first. Ladies okay. first. Sure, sure. Be galant that way. Go ahead. <laughs> Put me on the spot. Well, you know, it's a, it really is the ultimate paradigm shift for a lot of marketers. And it's one that I think many of us have been experiencing now for some time. But the whole idea of actually listening and conversing with consumers versus talking at them is obviously the most profound shift of our era in terms of media and what social media has really wrought. So I think the whole art of listening is something that's progressive for us. And we were talking before, I don't think we have it completely figured out organizationally because it's complex. For us, um, as a company that really got its roots in digital early on, frankly, it might surprise you that back in 1996, we had e-commerce on Clinique.com. And, and I really must give the credit to William Water for being kind of our patron, patron saint of digital. So because our core competency in digital grew out of e-commerce, our earliest um, efforts towards social listening probably started with our own brand websites, where we started putting 
ratings and reviews and started opening up the door to that kind of consumer content. We had to be aware of what people were saying. Fortunately, much, much of it was positive, but even when it was directional. And I would say our next step has been to make sure that we're doing a really good job in our own social channels. So we decided from you know, the start of having our first brand communities in Facebook that we would strive for a 100% response rate on questions. Yeah, and you're doing it on a luxury brand, and Michael yeah. is doing it across a whole other brands, and you each have a corporate brand as well as individual brands. Right. How do you deal mm -hmm. with it? Sure. We're, we're very fortunate, um, at least um, I'll speak mainly about the Coca-Cola brand specifically, but I say we're fortunate because in many cases, we didn't really have to figure out what to do with these new social platforms when they came about. And I'm speaking you know, over the course of the last five years, whether it was you know, YouTube back then or whether it was the era of Second Life or whether it was Friendster or MySpace, et cetera, in almost every single case, people assembled around our brand on these platforms before we even got a chance to figure out what to do. So it's a great privilege of people, you know, it's a social brand by nature, it's a happy brand, and people assemble around it. So in many cases, we gotta keep that really, really core, that insight, that observation, that listening, uh, we gotta keep that really core to our overall strategy. And we sum that up in simply calling it fans first. Mm -hmm. Our strategy is fans first. It's always remembering where we came from. It's always remembering that with nearly 35 million fans on Facebook, uh, that they are there to share their manifestations of their brand amongst themselves, not necessarily to give it to us. So when we keep that core to our strategy and to who we are, uh, it seems to have worked pretty it's well. Kinda, for it's like someone who I heard once sum it up by instead of listening harder, you listen softer in terms of what's behind the scenes, for it, which is really great. Uh, tee up another topic for you here. Subject of control. You've heard that a lot. Uh, I'm going to go old school on you. Uh, no question that, that, yeah, you got to give up some of the control of your marketing communications. But I'm going to say that when I hear people say, give up control of my brand to the consumer, I shudder in fear. Because they really shouldn't. And the thing that I would say is that you control the things you can control. A rock solid brand position that's built on dramatic and dynamic consumer insights. You passionately enthuse it and put it into every aspect of your company. Then you responsibly and respectfully communicate it. And then you persistently deliver that. Control the hell out of that. And then you can let your brand go and let people go with it. So that's, I think, a message that I would say that I disagree with some of that control issue. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you deal with it in, in your companies? Do you agree with it, first of all? Uh, I, I really like how you position that because I think that, um, I mean, th for some of you this might be a bit of a tired cliche, but I just think it works so well. It's the idea is that you have to think of yourself as a host of the conversational party. So that doesn't mean ceding all control, to be clear. I mean, you are facilitating, you're guiding, you're creating a good brand experience, but it is allowing the participation in. So for, for me, I've found that to be a very helpful metaphor and guiding principle for how we should think about it and how to kind of keep a good rudder to where we're kind of giving up too much control or we're not exerting enough control. And that principle really works. I think you're right also, if you have great brands, then you actually have to have the confidence in your brands. We're, being in beauty, we happen to be in one of the highest conversational volume categories that there is women love, and to a certain extent men, but really primarily women love to talk about beauty. So the good news is- Some things never change. Some things right? never change, and the good thing is social media facilitated a whole new opportunity for those conversations to happen, mm -hmm. but just now digitally. So. Um, so in giving up control, you're obviously gaining so much, which is allowing them to feel closer to the brand and part of the brand. Michael? The only thing I'd add, I think you also summed it up very well, and I agree with what you said. I think uh, there was a time when everyone talked about you know, releasing control, but I think you summed it up very well. As long as you have those things in place, you can, more comfortably, you can feel more comfortable and sleep at night when you're releasing control. And the only thing I guess I'd add to the conversation is by being prepared for the inevitable. The, what somebody says in one corner of the world, whether it's true or it's just said, at the end of the day, um, you know, perception's reality. So knowing how you're gonna respond and how quickly you respond and what platforms you're gonna respond, I think are the science behind yeah, and, and the, that comfort. You're right. Allowing you to sleep at night. Yeah, Those and I think also it's, you know, that, that is the, when you're used to having everything so tightly controlled, it is a little scary the first time you hit a comment that maybe 
is it's hard to read on one of your social channels. It's mm -hmm. like you sort of want to react. And I think the hard thing also to counsel is not to overreact and don't let that one person who's an outlier in how they're behaving, like, again, to use the party analogy, to really ruin the whole party. Yeah. Sure. And you, you know, Coke gets a ton of user-generated content in there yep. as well, don't you? So you have to, you really have to, uh, you know, be comfortable with the way it's used. So it's really, uh, it takes a lot of courage to do that, doesn't it? We do. Just for some scope, um, uh, in the last quarter, uh, we exceeded over 200,000 pieces of user-generated content that was posted on our social presences. And I'm primarily talking about the big three. So 200,000 pieces of UGC, of which, just for some perspective, uh, some 50,000 plus needed to be deleted. Mm. So when you got such big brand presences, you know, they, they attract people selling anything and everything from selling widgets to, you know, selling themselves, unfortunately, in many cases. So, you know, having a good science behind the moderation uh, and in many cases what we like to call curation. Uh, as you're taking out the garbage, you're also seeing the great content. And, you know, focusing in on the couple hundred thousand pieces of user-generated content surfaces incredible photos incredible videos and songs and poems and just phenomenal, again, manifestations of, of the brand uh, that people have taken on. That's great. Well said, Michael. Let's switch gears with you a little bit. Uh, all of this expression has led to something that you hear a lot of things, corporate CEOs talking about enlightened profit. Yeah, we, you have to deliver sales, but there's also the greater, you know, the emotional profit of the people that are in your, your community and your company and the greater good profit mm -hmm. out there in the community. And the whole world of cause marketing, you're both very much involved in that. But, but Estee Lauder particularly is. And, you know, you, I just threw this, I don't want to, you know, embarrass you here, but you, for 19 years they've been on the, doing things with breast cancer. Yeah. How is that now changing, and, and how did you get there, and, and how do you see that kind of engagement with consumers? Well, I mean, 19, our roots in breast cancer awareness go really deep all the way to actually Evelyn Lauder was one of the co-creators of the Pink Ribbons. So, I mean, really our roots in this cause are extremely deep and very committed to women and breast health and awareness as key to prevention and cure. Um, so we've done lots of things, many of which you may not even associate with the Estee Lauder companies, like when you see buildings lit around the world pink, that's the Estee Lauder companies doing that. So we've had really great initiatives or selling pink products, a portion of the proceeds of which go to breast cancer research. And it, a few years ago we said, my feeling is, oops, sorry, social media was made for social causes. So it was so natural for us to move this into, you know, into this you know, corollary to the offline campaign. And this year uh, we're doing a campaign called Shine a Light on Breast Cancer. So we're actually trying to translate what we've done with those world landmark illuminations to social media and let everyone feel like they have a little piece. I mean, it's a very simple act of participation. It's facebook.com slash BCA campaign if you're looking for it. Or, of course, on Twitter, we have Foursquare Integration, YouTube. But um, the thing that I'm actually most proud of, since we're talking a lot about organizational development, is that we are able to take this campaign and have 15 of our brands participate participate across over 25 countries. So the fact that we are really able to galvanize our own brand communities and find a way to make this campaign yeah. truly work across borders, I think is very, very exciting. And the, the key to it that I hear you say, and, I, I, and everything I read, you believe in it, you have a passion for it, it is your purpose. It's and, real. and especially now in our world, if you don't, consumers will see that right away. Yeah, we're in Breast Cancer yeah. Awareness Month right now, and there are a lot of companies who, you know, gone pink. Um, so it is very important to us that it's very genuine and not something that we've just sort of slapped on as a cause. Now, now that Michael's sitting there, one of the, the great, I don't know if any of you have ever heard the term liquid and linked through Coca-Cola, one of the great, great uh, programs and philosophies and points of view that I've seen in quite some time. Matter of fact, there was a whole lecture on that in my class the other day. And so talk about that, because there are some great lessons there, I think, that you can teach us in terms of the impressions to expressions with that. Sure. Uh, a couple of points. One, uh, I couldn't help but notice a lot of heads nodded when he mentioned, if you've heard of Liquid and Linked. And that's kind of representative of, of what Liquid and Linked is, is liquid meaning that it flows anywhere and everywhere. You know, so it's content designed to flow anywhere and everywhere and to be so uncontrollable that it, that it spreads. So that's, the, that's, that's literally not much more to it than that. That's what the liquid piece of it is. But the linked piece is incredible science to make sure it's linked back to our brand, our business, uh, and everything that we stand for. So that's, that's kind of the genesis of what liquid and linked is and remaining focused on our fans first strategy that I mentioned earlier. 
You mentioned the expressions and impressions piece. The impressions and expressions piece is just kind of a, a good recognition of uh, measurement. So if you look back, say, almost 15 years ago with the digital space, it took many years for digital marketers to talk to marketers and marketing speak. And what I mean by that is they talked about hits and clicks and page views while media was talking about impressions and never shall the two meet. So no one really knew what the ROI was. And I'm happy to see that in social, we're beginning to figure that out a whole lot quicker. We're not, hopefully we won't take 15 years. We'll begin to talk to marketers and marketing speak. And the impressions piece is, is vital to talking to marketers and media folks to have some type of apples-to-apples uh, apples comparison. But the expressions piece to Coke is a, a real expression of brand love and a, a way of measuring that value. And long story short, we don't have it all figured out. But we're focusing much more heavily on those expressions uh, of brand love and beginning to try and put a weight against them. So an expression of simply clicking a like is one expression. An expression of taking a photo and uploading it is another one. And yet taking and doing a video and taking the time to upload it or a blog is even more. So how do we have a, a weighted approach to each of those to begin to strategically target and increase or fuel conversations that then turn into more powerful expressions. Yeah, you know, it's, it's great to hear both of you say, you don't have it all figured out, you know? And so when you're in a small business or a growing business, you look around, it's the kind, none of us do. And that to me is the exciting part of it, isn't it? It's really great. Um, the uh, switch gears again, we talked uh, a little bit about expressions and you heard a lot about television and so on, but video, here's the thing that just came up, video, online video, explodes of people going to online sites. This is something that's been uh, put together by Pew and the Center for uh, American Studies. Triple, you know, 70% of people are online video. That you have watching a video, biggest online activity, even over Facebook, email, and other things. So you guys grew up in creating your brands on television and creating videos in one way. Now that you see this, how do you do it? You have, a, you have to do it with a luxury brand, you have to do it with a mass brand. So how do you do it? Well, I've, we have to do it for, mass, for luxury brands. Right. So we're very, very clear that each of our brands is brand led in their decision making and every, each one is gonna make the decision of this approach in any channel ind independently. But you know, just as I said before, that beauty is a really high conversational category. It's amazing the appetite that women have for beauty how-to videos. I mean, it's off the charts. Um, the last time we checked, I think it was the third most searched category in YouTube by women. And you think about all the possible categories of content, that's pretty astonishing for beauty. So that's a really good thing and a great opportunity. It's also a big challenge because it means that there's a ton of content, most of it user generated, much less so on the professional side. So what does it mean in terms of our role? And I think that's something that we've been in you know, an evolution of trying to figure out. So we've always had really good beauty how-to content on our websites, which we've syndicated to our YouTube channels. I think what's exciting is we're trying to be bigger and better about that. So you know we've worked mm -hmm. together with you on SJA Lauder, new global YouTube mm -hmm. uh, video channel. We've really committed to making these channels better. Same with our Clinique brand, has really looked at making global YouTube channel. And that's actually not very typical for brands in YouTube to think about how to globalize the channels. Um, and we have other brands who are just, I think, doing some really interesting things and trying to serve up the content so that it isn't so straightforward. So Bobby Brown, for example, is doing a how-to video of how to you know, get a you know, quick makeover look in the backseat of a cab. So that's sort of a fun, fresh way of bringing the content. And I think it really is about striking the balance between inviting in the right user-generated or sort of layperson slash expert content, but we're the experts. The brand is the expert. Again, to the control thing, we're not ceding that authority, and the consumer still wants to get that authority from us. So it's about having that right expert voice, and then, as you said, Michael, curating the right of the, the best of the rest. And Michael, your, your brand, you want people to be happy and play with your brand a little bit differently than, than maybe you do. So how do you guys handle it? I'd answer it at, at two different levels. One is, you know, our company has been around for 125 years and has made some really iconic ads. So that's at the core of who we are. We are about a lot of sight, sound, and motion, and that's what video is. So in some ways, we'll continue to do that. We just will be collecting up all those things that used to end up being on the cutting room floor and beginning to share them. So instead of focusing in on just that 30 second iconic spot, what about all the work and all the behind the scenes pieces and whether we're tweeting about it or, or leveraging those pieces in other areas, that's one level. The other level I'd shift to is really about just the amount of content we need to 
continue to generate and fuel conversations in social spaces. We need to be fast, quick, and nimble, and inexpensive. And the best example I can give you of that, and, and hopefully many of you will be aware of it, is the, uh, the happy, happiness machine. That's the vending machine where, uh, you know, was a, a wildly successful viral video that was done right here in New York City at a, uh, a university where uh, it was incredibly successful. It was done on a shoestring budget, and it has since fueled some 30 different examples very similar in other parts of the world. Yeah, the great thing, the lessons that both you teach is it's, it's about quality, and quality doesn't necessarily mean money. Right. It means content in the way where you, where you express your brand with it. Um, we, we talked about how brands have to be open now. They're constantly open, and, and the role of the CMO is changing. I love Seth Godin's line. Instead of chief marketing officer, it's chief movement officer. And you talked about how your role in uh, uh, going more towards teaching and doing things like that within a company. So talk about it. It is a good shout-out for your students out there. It is. Um, I have been surprised how much my role from the time that I, I kind of originated the role, frankly, in our company of a corporate digital marketing, and it has moved a lot towards education within the company. But And I say this in the most positive sense, and I love that I work for a company that values education as much as the Estee Lauder companies does, but it's also a recognition that digital has, I mean, like we've nothing we've ever seen because of the pace, because of the complexity, and because in many times it is a paradigm shift for senior executives who've always been at the top of their game in terms of knowledge, and, and sometimes that's turned on its head a little. So really recognizing the importance of providing comprehensive global digital education in the company as a means to ensuring our current and future success has become a big part of the job, and I actually really embrace that because it's like you said, it's the best time to be in the industry. It kept you here because you have to be constantly awake and learning. We know we have to do that in our jobs, but equally important is finding out a way to cascade that appropriately into a big organization. And that was your entry into Coke was that way, wasn't it? It was, it was. Uh, Hank's referring to uh, my entry into Coke was about five and a half years ago to help establish a curriculum across all of digital marketing. Uh, and it was recognizing that Coke was an incredibly iconic brand with just brilliant marketers around the world, but uh, was looking to establish some additional expertise and consistency around the world in its approaches to digital marketing. Uh, so yeah, we do have a, a relatively comprehensive yeah, curriculum of live training, e-learning training, uh, uh, even podcasting events to continue to share best practices around our system. Yeah, so you know, the lesson there is as we move from impressions to expressions, we're all learning, it's still learning. Now, I have, we have one, two minutes left. I want to ask each one of you to do this is for, for me personally. Shout out, we have 50 grad students sitting at USC. They're gonna go out into the real world in, a, in, in six months. What's your, what's your one minute advice for them, each of you? Okay, I, I really, really believe that if you are interested in a career in digital marketing, that you need to understand digital for sure, but you need to fundamentally learn how to be a good marketer. Because where we're all going is we stop thinking of this as channels and start thinking of it as truly just how the consumer lives her life today and therefore this is how we have to reach her. The, the person that can bring a truly innate understanding of how to be a good marketer, how to touch a consumer with the knowledge overlaid of how digital works, that's gonna be an absolutely golden skill set and make that person in turn highly marketable to organizations. Great advice. So that's my advice. Good. Michael? That's difficult. I think uh, with that in mind, uh, you know, knowing the basics and understanding and, and hoping that these students, I'm looking right into the camera at you students, and saying, uh, be hungry, um, listen, uh, and focus on the fans. You know, I think that's like I said, for with Coca-Cola, this fans first approach has served us well. And I think uh, knowing the basics and applying the basics in a, in a new world with a very open mind, uh, experiencing all things, whether it's right for you or just right for others, I think is really important to uh, better understanding consumers now and what they'll be like next year and the year thereafter. Great advice, great panel, huh? Weren't they terrific? And uh, I have one, I have one piece of advice to the students. I hope you're listening because this is going to be on the next quiz. <laughs> I'll, see you, I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you very right. much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Very well done. All right. So, hanging in there?